Uh, hello everyone, we're back with Fate Grand Order with uh, Avalon the Fae. Last time we finished, like, is it Act 1, Part 1? Uh, we're, we're on the second third of it. <laughs> and by second third I mean like it's actually way longer than the other two thirds, but <laughs> that doesn't matter. <laughs> right, anyway, last time we finished up in Norwich, uh, Mashu got teleported away again. Oh no, that's awful. And it looks like we're gonna be with Holmes and Gordolf? I mean, like, you know, this is the the Storm Border? Didn't they change his name? Whatever it's called. Anyway, intro. Maybe this will be like a recap. Act 2. Extra, extra! Read all about it. <laughs> for, extra from the deck. The Vinci's Tiphone is back. Is, is that like a, t a type of pigeon? Tiphone? Thanks, Marine. Let Tiphone rest up in her cage until we're done writing our response. Scans for hazardous substances and containments are clear. It's a report from Da Vinci. Director Music, Holmes, if you would. Very well. Let's take a look. Hum, I see. Ho oh, ho, fascinating. He just wants to read. Head, heads of the fairy clan's calamities. A mysterious fairy, fairy horse who goes by Ranger Bit. Yes, this report is proven by yet another scintillating array of tidbits. Care to read it yourself, Gordolf? <laughs> yes, of course! I am Caldeo's director, after all. It's my job to stay abreast of our latest developments. Yeah, you know, I always say this, but I love it whenever they, they like communicate with sprites, right? Like they use body language. If you're all piped down, Captain Marines, and Pato Paul, I, I don't know how to say that. I know who he's talking about, though. French cooking boy. Or read it out loud so you can follow along. Alright, to start off, let's go over what we know about Fairy Britain thus far. Yeah, okay, it's it's a recap episode. Oh, small Gordol. Fairy Britain, aka the Sixth Lost Belt, is a dangerous place where no electronic devices can function. I remember back in, like, the Japanese servers, there was, like, a month or two delay between... Part 1 and Part 2. On NA though, I think it was only like 2 weeks? Horsey, Kaldea's resident master and special investigations officer. His exclusive servant, Mashu Kiraylite. Our technical advisor, Leonardo da Vinci and Tristan, servant who was summoned out of nowhere. All set foot on Britain together. However, upon entering the fatal domain known as the Nameless Woods, they forgot their own names and memories and ended up separated. Horsey awoke in the village of Cornwall, where he made contact with a local fairy, a Toria Caster, who would come to aid Caldea on our mission. I wonder if they can mention the Nameless Fairy at all. Thanks to her and Tristan, Horsey escaped from the Nameless Woods. Because she's coming- Okay, you know, they're not doing it. <laughs> because, you remember, Artoria named her, and we never found out what the name was, so we know that's going to be important somehow. <laughs> we then met another collaborator by the name of Oberon the Fairy King. Began his investigation in earnest. Through uniting with Da Vinci, Horsey began gathering information on Fairy Britain with a focus on anything that might lead him to Mashu Kirei Light. The Slash Boat's king is Morgan, a fairy who has been ruling for the past 2,000 years. The fairies who populated are divided into six clans that control the human population. There are creatures known as Moors who are also the fairies' natural predators. There are also Tomlin, fairy knights who possess the name of. Oh, typo! Ho ho ho! The names of heroic spirits from proper human history. There are calamities that occur every hundred years, great calamities that occur every thousand. And there's a figure called the Child of Prophecy who is said to be the one who will defeat Morgan. They're undertaking a pilgrimage during six spells kept by each heads of the six clans. She will then go on to defeat Morgan, become the true king of Britain. Naturally, as you can imagine, Horsey would never let her do something like that on her own. So I proposed a partnership with Autoria Caster without even waiting for my orders. <laughs> He's not salty about that. So now we are obliged to lend the child of prophecy our full support in order to defeat our common enemy, Morgan. The time since their last report, Horsey's team met with Aurora, the head of the Wing Clan. They were running with Tomlin Gawain at a ranch for keeping humans. Fought Tomlin Tristan in an auction house, where they also rescued Senji Morimasa, servant disciple of the foreign god. 
Right with Morian, the head of the Wing Clan. Tell it's Queen Sky and get another new outfit. <laughs> That's better. And another local fairy by the name of Gareth and a mysterious fey horse called Gaedrabid join their team. Their series of adventures, including a battle against the Drakkei in the River of Tears. Okay, are, are, they're caught up to date then? I, I thought they might be a bit behind just because, you know, pigeons take time to get from one place to the other. Where's this team finally arrived in the city of Norwich? There, who should they encounter but Machu Kirelite, whom the local fairies believe to be the child of prophecy. I need to sneeze. Uh, no matter how many times I agree with this part, it still doesn't make sense to me. How did Kirelite come to be known as the child of prophecy? Oh, he didn't get Machu to send in the pigeons. Ah, oh, dang it. What in the world is a happy cat? If only this report could respond to the questions. Since again, we'll just have to use our imaginations to fill in the gaps. Actually, the whole part with, um, Bogger and that, that's just Gordolf making it up. None of that actually happened. Guessing Kirelite had her own share of troubles after escaping the Nameless Woods. At one point, she probably ended up saving some people. Uh, fairies? I'm in the northern part of Britain. Probably led them to regard her as a hero. Anyway, the report also says that Horsey's team made contact with the Crypt of Pepperance, you know, who've been lying low in Norwich. Through numerous mishaps, the Calamity of Norwich finally appeared. Fortunately, with Count Dea's help, the Child of Prophecy was able to defeat this Calamity. However, shortly after Mashu Kirilite had finally been reunited with Horsey, she was whisked away to parts unknown by a mysterious phenomenon, separating her from Horsey once again. But there's no time to grieve this unfortunate turn of events. Certain Horsey would agree. Yeah, oh no, Mashu's separated from us. Oh no, whatever will I do? What well, you see in a surprising turn of events? He and Artoria were invited to Camelot, home of King Arthur and Proper Human Ministry, location of the evil castle in Fairy Britain, by High Queen Morgan herself. The Fairy Morgan who possesses Yungo Miniad, a powerful spell that could be used to fight the foreign god, one of our main objectives in coming to this last spot in the first place. Now, Horsey, Da Vinci, Artoria, Gareth, Moramasa, and uh, Abby Cat. I've accepted Morgan's invitation. I forgot she was with us. They're setting out for Camelot first thing tomorrow. And that's all she wrote. Now, do you all feel sufficiently caught up? That's a loud car outside. <laughs> yeah, we got most of that. Thanks. Okay, we're gonna head back to our post now. The name of Marines like being included. Sounds like things are pretty crazy out there again. Oh, Mosh was okay. Yeah, screw Horsey though. I hope he dies. Not to worry, Defensi's report was quite upbeat, so if nothing else, we can be certain that Mashu is safe. The real problem is this water mirror spell of Morgan's. According to the data enclosed along with the report, it would seem that- What if Mashu just teleports right, right into the storm order? <laughs> so those dark clouds over the city of Norwich were not a calamity pool, one of Morgan's spells. It's hard to believe she was able to remotely control such a powerful spell from over 100 kilometers away. Between this water mirror and- Rango Miniad, it's clear she's a powerful enemy on par with any of the other Lost Belt Kings we've seen. Afraid I don't know much about Morgan's legend, could I ask you to fill me in? I only know her story from proper human history. If you settle for that, for that, then sure. Let's start with a general background. According to British myth, she is the good fairy of the lake. In the legend of King Arthur, she's depicted as an evil witch bent on destroying him. Morgan was the child of the Duke of Tintagel. And Tangle and Lady Igraine. What was that name mentioned sometime recently? Um, Tintagel? I, I feel like it has been. Later became King Arthur's half sister after her, mar her mother married King Uther. Oh, okay, they're only related by marriage? Despite their family ties, she grew jealous of him, began plotting all sorts of wickedness to make his life miserable. It, I think it depends on the version, um, because. In some versions of Arthurian lore, there's a character called Morgase, I believe? Morgas? I don't know how to say her name. And in others, Morgas and Morgan are the same person. Morgas being Arthur's half-sister. Some of her more notable misdeeds include stealing the Sacred Sword Scabbard and seducing Lancelot. But the worst thing she did was trick King Arthur into impregnating her with Mordred, which she later sent to join the Round Table. There are a lot of factors leading to the downfall of King Arthur's kingdom. Morgan's definitely the one who tipped it over the edge. Paradoxically, 
There are also those who believe another side of Morgan was devoted to protecting King Arthur. Are they going to talk about? These theories claim that Morgan of Vivane, the Lady of the Lake who gave King Arthur the Sacred Sword and protected him, protected him in death, are in fact the same person. I've never heard that one outside the Nasu verse before. Is that Nasu just making stuff up again? Sounds like her lust for power led to her becoming a femme fatale who ruined an entire nation. So what's the Magecraft world's consensus on her? There must be more to her story than what's commonly known. Indeed there is. Went through our database myself after receiving our technical advisor's first report. There's one bombshell right out of the gate. It relates to her birth. Turns out Morgan was not actually the Duke of Tintagel's daughter. It was only a pretense. She was actually the child of Lady Ygraine and King Uther, the rightful King of Britain. Okay, okay. Or stunningly still, Morgan was never human. Instead, she was a fey child, an offspring of the Isle of Britain, just like Vertigern, the cowardly king. That's the guy Uther fought, right? But apparently, Morgan kept that fact secret, pretending to be merely a normal human child. So with King Uther as her father, and the absence of a rightful heir, she would have been next in line for the throne. But then an Artoria cape popped up. But then a rightful heir did appear. Once Artoria, King Arthur was accepted by the Sacred Sword and unified the Lords of Britain under her leadership. Morgan stopped hiding her mystics, that is, the power of her fey nature, by poisoning Camel on every chance she could. She told herself, Artoria is nothing more than a human king, made so by other humans. I am Britain's true king. I alone deserve to inherit its mystics. This conviction of hers grew to the point that she eventually came to despise her father, King Uther. Her sister Artoria, every human who refused to obey her, was a major factor in her decision, decision to try to destroy Britain. Why did King Arthur's once noble sister, Morgan, become Camelot's greatest enemy in her later years? Apparently that's the answer. Yep, even after she'd settled in as Queen of Orkney, she still plotted Camelot's downfall from afar. Maybe she just didn't want to have to lead a place called Orkney. Like, come on, that's a silly sounding name. That was British. Am I right, guys? Am I right? Four of the Knights of the Round Table, Gawain, Geharis, Gareth, and Agravain were Morgan's children. Mordred was, well, I don't know how I, if I should say this without them here. Okay, see, I didn't know this much. I don't know who Geharis is, but obviously Gareth and Agravain have shown up. Some experts think they were actually a homunculus Morgan created. What? Some expert? <laughs> That's some excerpts from Nasu. Morgan creator, or maybe a clone of King Arthur. Particulars like that aside, it sounds pretty clear that she was an enemy of King Arthur. And a witch who tried to destroy all of Britain. So what are we what about the supposed side of her that was focused on keeping King Arthur safe? An excellent question, Captain. There are numerous Arthurian legends, and each of them describes Morgan differently. One claims she was King Arthur's noble sister, another claims she was the Lady of the Lake, and another claims she had been a goddess of Britain since ancient... Uh, okay, who who says that one? Nasu, who says that one? Na name one person bes besides you. Well, no, actually, isn't... I, okay, oh, hold on, oh, there might actually be some backing to that. Um, Celtic mythology, isn't Morgan's name derived from it? Like, um... So, the Morgane? Is that it? I, I think that's where her name comes from. Needless to say, each claim would seem to rule the others out as a possibility. Common sense would dictate that one of these theories is correct and the others refer to someone else entirely. But I believe that they are, in fact, all true. That Morgan was possessed of three aspects. Okay, sure thing, Holmes, whatever you say. Given that she was born under supernatural circumstances, surmise that her human side. Her fairy side and the part of her that was Britain's own avatar all, all existed simultaneously. But like these parts of herself are essentially irrecon irreconcilable. How do you say that? Irreconcilable. So irreconcilable. I don't know, man. <laughs> Within a single entity. I suspect each of these aspects became an independent being. One was her human side, Artoria's kind older sister Morgan. Another was her fairy side, Vivienne, the Lady of the Lake. The third was the Avatar of Britain, Morgan Le Fay. I mean, they could have, I mean, it could have brought more, more gays, or whatever the name is into this, but I guess, gotta be confused, they have two Morgans. If we assume them to be the case, everything makes sense. The next to the round table, then, did not bring her to justice because she was both evil and good. 
That doesn't make any sense. Well, whatever you say, Holmes, yeah. Now I see. Okay, I'm convinced. But hang on. Isn't Vivian another name for Namue? I don't know how to say that, but... Yeah, yes. The fairy who imprisoned Merlin? Yes, it is. Morgan is both King Arthur's rival and Merlin's greatest enemy. Though Merlin was the one who taught Vivian Magecraft, infatuation with him eventually led to her despising him, and ultimately sealing him away. To do so, she employed a great bounded field in the form of a sarcophagus spell scrubbed with the words, Only those free of sin may pass. As an incubus, not even Merlin could escape it. As a spell from the Age of Gods known as Garden, it could only be used as an avatar of a mystic. Dude, Nasu is bringing out all of it. Like, he had like just a bunch of old, like, Sticky notes written down, <laughs> pull up Camelot lore. He's bringing them all out for this chapter. But it's still unclear how much this Lost Vaults Morgan has in common with the Morgan from proper human history. It seems prudent, prudent to assume that she has more weapons at her disposal than Yrongo Minion alone. Uh, first it's the Lion King of Jerusalem, now it's Morgan and Fairy Burden, huh? I swear, why are we always getting mixed up with Arthurian legends? And I can understand it in this case since we're in Britain now and all, but still. I mean, what are we going to do if Albion shows up next? I don't even think the Storm Order would have a chance. Is I thought Albion was just Britain. Albion? That is what this, this isle was known as, in, known as in ancient times, before it came to be called Britain. Though, of course, that name also refers to something else in the Magecraft world. There, it refers to the last pure-blooded dragon, Albion. I'll go. Extinct Phantasmal, who remained on the Isle of Britain even as the Age of Gods came to an end. Th this is going to be relevant later, isn't it? <laughs> the creatures who we call dragons today are simply animals who happen to be acquire some of the dragon genes left behind by the dragonkin who went over to the reverse side of the world. And ended up adopting the dragon's way of life while preserving their own. With the exception of Albion's corpse, not a single pure-blooded dragon is left on this entire planet. Yes, that's what they say in the clock tower, isn't it? Quite a romantic notion, that. But that is all, all it is. And now we get but one in a long list of fairy tales, of course. More importantly, it is now been 28 days since we began this mission. Okay, so we got like three weeks left. Uh, thanks to the concentrated fruit essences, our fruit essences? Our technical advisor has been sending along with her reports. We now have magical energy to spare, which will let us remain here past our initial 50 day estimate. Okay, Nasu was like, okay, I don't want to have to time management. <laughs> Perhaps we should advise them to stop by the border. True, sure, maybe we should. Ideally, I was hoping to complete the mission within 30 days, but that's clearly not going to happen. That said, we still don't know exactly when the collapse is going to begin, so we shouldn't be too quick to change our time limit. We stick to our initial plan. We still have 17 days left to complete the mission. Do you think Horsey's team can pull it off in that time frame, Holmes? Well, according to Da Vinci's report, it seems the circumstances are nearly all in place. I mean, yeah, that's true, like, you know... Act 1, we, we wasted like a week or two just getting out of the Nameless Woods, finding Da Vinci, right? We now know where everything is. We could go ring those bells. Gotta kill the, gar the gargoyles first, and you know, obviously Chaos Witch, Quay Lag. But I think we could get it done. Their meeting with High Queen Morgan ends peacefully, and she proves willing to share information about Rungo Minion with them. Then we can devote the rest of their time to investigating the Collapse. And if it doesn't end peacefully, then we're dead. <laughs> Now that Chaldea has thrown their lot in with the Child of Prophecy, war is all but inevitable. We already know the extent of Fairy Burden's military power. If Artoria is able to complete her pilgrimage and muster a significant anti-queen force, the Battle of Camelot will be decided in a single day. I suspect that battle will take place in 16 days at the earliest, just barely within our deadline. <laughs> Holmes said it so you know it's true. Okay, Act 2 takes place over the course of just over two weeks then. Is that quartz? Okay, so since this one was short, I know the next one's very long. So I'm gonna do like one arrow a bit. That's four is that seven? I don't know why I said fourteen. Yeah, that's seven. There's a chest though. I wonder what that is. An outfit? I know Morgan has some outfits. Is it one of those? Or it, Morgan just gives us the grail. Okay, get get out of here, you, you losers. <laughs> End of the last belt. Ten. Camelot. It is a silly place.
You can hear people singing the Child of Prophecy song in the streets. I'm not singing. I'm not singing. Can we notice Fairy Island? Wait, was that Fairy Island or Fairy Land? Fairy Land. With the innocent return, here stands the Queen's unknowable castle. Falls, it falls, like rain, like ash. Vanishes, it vanishes, like snow, like lies. Desires languish deferred. But now we dance in the palm of the Queen's hand. This is like a King Crimson song? Require now only a little more patience. For two thousand years, the dawn shall bring the child who will be our salvation. It shall be the child who saves the world, binds both peoples together. I'm not singing. <laughs> Even if her light begins as but a number, even should no one see it, she will become as a phlegm to draw moths. City of iron, sea of suit. Okay, it's the prophecy then. Okay, okay. The calamity recedes, her pilgrimage begins. Chosen by the staff of selection, the savior, guarded by travelers from afar, shall reach the throne. That's what we're doing! We're reaching the throne! The true king shall arrive at the throne. Except now this bloodied crown. Ring, ring, like raging thunder, weeping flame, let us hearken to the six bells ringing, blaze the path of the true king. So, bloodied crown? What is it? Are you gonna take it off Morgan's head? <laughs> um, raging thunder and weeping flame. I... Do you think those refer to the Tomlin? Specifically, um, so Gawain's flame, I mean, Lancelot could be thunder, like, she's, she's fast, right? So, I mean, that, like, maybe, like, like, or the red calamity catches us, or the black calamity devours us. Um, so, black calamity is Moors? I don't know what the red one is. Indolent Dur Durellicit, that's how you say that. Though we may be, we are the scions, the free fae. Never have we wished for anything. Still we desire a shining future. Don't so mention a Norwich which being destroyed in that song. So why did Oberon say there's nothing anyone can do to stop its destruction? Oberon? You lying to us? Wonder, does he know more of this song than everyone else? But Oberon being saucy would never. I do, as a matter of fact. Perhaps he actually has 18 verses in total. Oh, how many verses was that? Most fairies are only familiar with the 14 we just heard, but there are actually four more. Yeah, let's hear them. I knew it. Why didn't you tell us this sooner, Oberon? I just forgot to mention it. Oh, that's pretty sus. Sorry, can we please drop it? Uh, well, what are the four verses? Guessing you had a reason you couldn't tell us? In your retrospect, maybe I was being a little overprotective. Sorry about that. Alright, I'll tell you. These are the other four verses of the prophecy. This is I heard them. Verse 8.5 The harbor shall return to empty shore. The calamity shall vanish into the distant sky. Okay, so that's... That's Norwich. 9.5 The round fortress shall burn, and the bell of water shall appear. The round fortress. Okay. 10.5 Confessed sinners shall make the acquaintance of the guillotine. Okay. 12.5. Having fulfilled her role, the child of prophecy shall say farewell to her home. Would her home here be Britain, or would it be, um, the, the city she grew up in that got, like, attacked? As you can see, these verses are a lot more ominous. Uh, how do you know this? That and the fact that they're not very precise for a prophecy might be why they were excised. Case in point, verse 8.5. The harbor shall return to empty shore, but the calamity shall vanish into the distant sky. The harbor is obviously Norwich, and the empty shore part must mean the city was going to be wiped off the coast. What if this is over on reading too much into it, and actually that hasn't happened yet? <laughs> so I was stealing myself to lose Norwich, even if we were able to repel the calamity, but, well... Or, like, Morgan's gonna nuke Norwich, it just doesn't happen yet. <laughs> Norwich didn't fall. Is it because another child of prophecy appeared? Could be. Basically proves that not even Einzel's prophecies are perfect. Especially for these four verses. So I've decided I'm just not going to worry about them anymore. Oh, no, 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 no. Now, on a more important note, you guys need to get going soon. What about you? Between Artoria, Gareth, Moore, Moss, and Habitron, I think you should all be safe without me. I hope you don't mind if I go off on my own again. More information gathering? Partly, yes. I also just really want to give Spriggan his, his comeuppance. Do that I'd stay here and work with the Count to knock him down a peg or two dozen until he hits rock bottom. Besides, 
could have been reunited with Mashu much sooner if he hadn't insisted on keeping the Child of Prophecy in his castle. Don't you think he deserves at least a little punishment for that? Uh, make sure to hit him where it really hurts. The wallet. Just leave it to me! Bloodshed may not be Fairy King's, the Fairy King style, but I can definitely bleed him dry financially. Before we leave, there's something I need to let you all know. Yeah? Let me guess. Oberon's going off on his own again, right? Got a feeling he might. Gotcha. Well, guess we don't all, all have to stick together all the time. I feel like he's much help in combat. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, nobody knows how Oberon works, let's be real. Sure, Oberon will be fine on his own. How come Rage isn't here either? Oh no. Staying behind too. Technically, he's still a Roy's retainer after all. I mean, he always did feel kind of weird. Like, he, he was like... But kind of like he slightly broke the fourth wall every time he was on camera, you know? And it wouldn't be good for her if we were seen with us right now. So we're gonna have him stay here with Oberon. Bring the carriage if we need it. I see. That makes sense. But, um, you there, the pink fairy. Have a try, right? Are you coming with us, too? In the way to gamble, it's probably pretty dangerous, so... Don't worry about me. I'll be fine. Just leaving me as a spectator along for the ride. Like, you should probably be more worried about yourself than me, Gareth. I'm the irreplaceable healer every party needs in combat, and I'm probably stronger than you, too. Don't worry, horsey. I'm not gonna let you die before you and Masha are united, but also, like, everyone focuses the healer first. So, I mean, you're, you're dead, Abachon, I'm sorry. Feel free to wait into battle all you like. So long as you don't die, you can patch you up with my magic needle no matter how what horrific injuries you sustain. Uh, good to know, thanks. Don't say Nightingale's name, she might hear you. Quiet, everyone. Here comes the Queen's troops from the main gate. Hi, Gawain. Apologize for the 10 minute delay. I'm Tomlin Gawain. These are the 30 members of the 1st Royal Knight Moors Extermination Brigade. We're the ones who will be providing you, honored guests of Camelot, with safe passage. Um, say something, Victoria! Come on, come on, elbow! Like, give her the elbow. Oh, yay! Thanks for taking the trouble to come get us. Don't care if all that bulk will make you cranky on the journey there. You better treat us with respect, got it? Oh, okay, we should have just said something. That is the plan, yes. We have readied a carriage for the Trout of Prophecy and the Foreign Mage. Your retainers will need a walk. Guess that is all you. You're that scoundrel who tried to assassinate the High Queen. How are you still alive? It's all you fall into the pit. You know, he's, he's sure he can't die. All that? Hey, Lancelot, enemy my butt and toss me right into the pit. But unfortunately for you, I managed to survive. Now I'm the child of Prophecy's bodyguard. Next time you see Lancelot, tell her not to take your eyes off a servant until their spirit origin's completely gone. Don't, don't tell her. Don't tell her that. Yeah. Well, it's grand. What should we do, Lady Gawain? We're really gonna let this man back into Camelot? What if he tries to assassinate the queen again? It's alright. If he does, he won't have the element of surprise anymore. I can take him myself. Especially now that the Queen has assured me not to worry if combat damages or destroys the castle. Oh no. Camelot. Yeah? Hey, that's great. Really fit in the place anyway. It'll help you move around better. You do be big. Next time we fight, I'd rather be head to head without either of us holding anything back. Hmm. Guess the Child of Prophecy has something of an eye for talent after all. Not very much your other retainers suggest otherwise. Oh, come on! They're, they're cute at least. Fine. You there. Make room in one of, one of the carts for our guests. The servants can ride with a foreign mage. Treating those two as honored guests, at least until we reach the castle, help us all move faster. Yes, my lady. Right away. We'll be taking their western road to Camelot. Spend our one night at, at Oxford along the way. We'll then take a detour along the pit towards Camelot. The next two days, our fates shall be intertwined. Our fate's grand orders shall be intertwined. Uh, is Oxford the town that they pass by but they, but they don't stop in? I think it is. We shall not return to turn our swords on one each other, regardless of what may happen. Do you agree to that, foreign mage? Uh, don't don't make promises to the Fae. Don't say it out loud, maybe that nod. I mean, it, it sounds like a pretty good promise, but also, like, you know. Good. Let us be off. Soldiers, do not let your guard down simply because this is an escort mission. Calamity's destruction has led to Moore's toxins spreading far and wide across Britain. 
Eliminate any moors you come across immediately upon discovery. I don't want to even hear even a peep of discomfort from our guests. Oh, okay. I was kind of thinking you'd cut there, but wasn't for sure. Great. So that's... Is that... Oh, that's past Oxford. Giant Hall East. Okay. That's a good stopping point for today. Next time we'll start Act 2 proper, I guess. I mean, I guess we kind of started it today, right? But we'll start start it. It's weird we're only on section 10, right? <laughs> like, we're so far in. This is... I looked at the word count. Like, Lost Boat 6 is, like, leagues above anything. Like, even Lost Boat 7, I think, is only, like, half the length of Lost Boat 6. It's, ri it's ridiculous. <laughs> Nasu went all out on this one. Like, it really does feel like he... He wanted to write, like, a standalone story. And, you know... It, it just kind of got... Became part of Fate Grand Order, right? Which, I mean, I'm all for it. But is there anything new? It, it says there's something new when there is, right? I think so. Anyways, see you guys next time. Bye.